If it's nerdy, we're into it. Gaming, movies, television, wrestling, comics, whatever. We are Kyle Eckert and Chris Heck, two lifelong friends with a passion for the world of geekery. And this is the Geek Catch-Up Podcast. Welcome back, Geek Ketchum family. I'm Chris Heck. And I'm Kyle Eckerd. We are still hanging out in Season 2, and this is Chapter 33. Today we are going to be diving into the world of the Marvel Television Universe to share our thoughts on the recently concluded miniseries WandaVision, as well as some initial impressions of the Falcon and Winter Soldier series that just premiered. But before we get started, we both want to send a big thank you to everyone for listening to the show and share that we truly appreciate you choosing to spend your time with us. If you've enjoyed Geek Catch-Up, then be sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss a chapter and leave us a review to let us know how you think we're doing. You can also find us on social media to get updates on the show and content from the world of geekery. Geek Catch-Up Podcast on Facebook and YouTube, at Geek Catch-Up Pod on Instagram and Twitter. You can find all the links to these accounts in the show notes below and on our website, geekcatchuppodcast.com. There's even links to our Patreon and PayPal pages if you'd like to support the show. But the absolute best thing you can do is simply share Geek Catch Up with your friends and family. So with that out of the way, let's jump right into WandaVision. For those following Marvel's Cinematic Universe, you know Wanda Maximoff, played by Elizabeth Olsen, as a Sarkovian orphan that was part of experiments conducted by Hydra, and is capable of wielding very powerful magic. She started out as a villain in Avengers Age of Ultron, but has ascended to a role with the Avengers as a hero through the events of subsequent movies like Civil War, Avengers Infinity War, and Endgame. It's during this transition that Wanda meets Vision, played by Paul Bettany, the most advanced android on the planet who was made by Ultron and Dr. Helen Chow during the Age of Ultron movie, in order to house Ultron's consciousness. Being made from vibranium and the mind infinity stone, Vision immediately became one of the most powerful and intelligent beings in the MCU. Thankfully, though, he quickly switches allegiances and joins the Avengers over Ultron. After their initial meeting, fans see the moments throughout multiple films where Wanda and Vision become closer and ultimately culminate in a romantic relationship before Thanos rips the Mind Stone from Vision's head and kills him. Now, of course, the events of the MCU differ from the true origins of Wanda, Vision, and their meeting, but since we are going to be focused on the WandaVision show and how the story has progressed after Avengers Endgame, we won't be digging into the comic history. However, we definitely recommend you go check both characters' storied histories if you like them, as both have been part of some major Marvel moments. So back on January 15th, Disney Plus released the first two of the nine episodes that made up the WandaVision miniseries, with its final episode airing on March 5th. Those first two episodes definitely made it clear that Marvel was taking new risks with artistic styling and storytelling, and while most fans seemed to respond positively to it, there have been some that didn't like it as much. So let's start there, Kyle, by talking about which side of the line you were on, But real quick, before we do, we should also call out here that if you have not yet watched WandaVision or the first few episodes of Falcon and Winter Soldier, then consider this your spoiler warning because we will be digging into the events of both throughout this chapter. So I, this may come as a shock, but I'm going to fall on the line of, I don't think I actually enjoyed WandaVision all that much. Now, that's not to say it wasn't good. Because it was definitely very good. Pretty much everything Marvel Studios puts out is amazing. And so you look at it stylistically, it's good. The story is intriguing, very much so. A lot of what they set up going forward, you know, I'm not going to go into everything here right now in the very opening segment. But I will say, I don't know going forward if wandavision is going to be a true staple for me like civil war Endgame, infinity war pretty much all of the captain america series like winter soldier is one of my favorite movies if not my favorite marvel movie sure so i, I it was good and and game recognized game i liked what they did i liked the thought process but at the end of the day when i really thought about it i 
I don't think I enjoyed WandaVision as much as everyone else seems to have enjoyed it. That is fair, and I'm a little surprised to hear it, but also not not surprised. Simply because when I was watching it as it came out, week to week, I really enjoyed it. You know, getting those snapshots, looking forward to the each Friday to get that new episode. Yeah. And then when I went back and rewatched it again in preparation for our discussion here, I actually had some more thoughts of, okay, this is not quite as exciting or as, oh my God, awesome as I thought it was at the time. Right. But like you, it's still enjoyable. And really where I ended up settling was that I was, I'm really happy that it's a mini series. Yeah. If we were having this conversation right now and the expectation was that this is just a new show, we're going to get multiple seasons of it and this continuing storyline in this style, I don't know if I would feel like that would be necessary. Yeah. And so looking at it as a one shot, it makes more sense. And I think that that was smart that they did it. And going forward, I, I do agree, though, that it ultimately may kind of just get lost in the shuffle of how much Marvel content is out there, even though that it is supposed to have set up some very significant things that are coming in the next Marvel phase. So it's, it's important. Yeah. But is it going to be something you're going to want to go back and watch over and over again? I think that's going to be debatable. Yeah, and I think you you nailed my exact feelings. Like, I watched it once, and then I, I've watched through it twice. And both times, I actually thought to myself, uh, now, I didn't watch, I should, I should clarify, I didn't watch it on the weekly release. Uh, I, I had committed that I was going to wait for it all to end, and then I was going to, to watch it all at once, or not necessarily all at once, but make sure that the next episode was ready for me when I finished. And ultimately, it it got to a spot where I couldn't put it off any farther, knowing we were going to chat about it. So I I needed to watch it. And then I was fortunate enough to be able to get a second watch through between that time and this time. But as I was watching it, I I thought, I don't know if I was watching this weekly, if I'd be able to stick with it, especially in the early going. In those first couple episodes, like when they go to the, you know, the 50s scene and the 60s and the 70s scene. They are all really interesting and intriguing in their own right, but I don't know if week to week that would have been enough to hook me. And I I didn't really start to enjoy the series until the back half when it became like part Marvel cinematic epic mixed with sci-fi horror and and things like that. So that's where it got really interesting and I, I really started to dive in and not as not pay more attention, but be more invested. It was like, okay, well, now we're finally getting to the meat and potatoes of what's going on. And while the beginning episodes were great for laying a foundation, and there were a lot of callbacks, so you needed those early episodes to make the epi- the late ones what they were. But I thought to myself, especially after that, the opening two episodes where they they did like the Dick Van Dyke right. and the the be- bewitched styled you know studio coming to you live from the studio audience blah 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 yeah black and white the black and white ones i was like man if i watch these if that's all i got i turned it on on a friday afternoon and that is all i got and then it ended and i had to wait another week to then get a very similar episode i'm not sure if it would have held my attention Yeah, well, and I think that's when it started to divide people. And I think when I first watched the first episode or two, I might have said it to you or to a group chat that we were texting about it that that it was a bold move. And that I and I said right there because I watched it early in the day that there were definitely going to be people that were going to watch it and hate it and not move forward. And so I think that Marvel probably recognized some of that, too, because with this, they actually released both black and white episodes. So both of the first two episodes together. Yeah. And so that way you were kind of able to watch all of it at once. And, you know, by the time you get to the end of that second episode, they bring in definitely a lot more of some of the mystery stuff that's, you know, kind of working. Yeah. And I think that that's what really kept me intrigued at the beginning was because they kind of just peppered in just enough 
of these mystery type elements or like the something isn't right here, you know? And so it kind of yeah. carried you beyond just what you were seeing with that old school styling. And I know like my brother-in-law watched the first few and was like, what the hell is going on? You know, this is not what I signed up for. And he's a more, more casual Marvel fan. He's not following the blogs and, yeah. and you know, <laughs> everything that's going on with the announcements and, and whatnot. So coming in as a more casual fan, jumping in and, and seeing the old school style, the black and white, you know, it kind of jarred him and he had stopped watching until I had said, no, just keep going. It changes over to color. It gets much more where you would like and what you were used to with Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe content. Yeah. And, and I don't know if I quite caught if he ever went back to see if, you know, my recommendation proved true, but I, I think it was just an interesting gamble. And that styling for me was kind of questionable at front, but it was odd because it was creating this weird sense of nostalgia. Oh, yeah. You know, like, because they did it so well. Like, it was so on the money for the different shows that they touched on, the different eras. And, you know, we're not old enough to have grown up in that time of television, per se, but where we grew up in the 80s and 90s, a lot of those shows from the 50s, 60s, 70s, early 80s were all still syndicated and on TV yeah. all the time. TV land, man. Right, yeah, the TV land kind of shows. But, I mean, you could turn on that any channel. Uh, well, I think Nickelodeon was... TV land originally came out of late-night Nickelodeon and then it ultimately became its own channel. True, yeah. Where it, it would rerun those, like, the Dick Van Dyke, I Love Lucy, I Dream of Jeannie... There, there was a touch of Twilight Zone yep. in there as well. So it was bringing back all of those, which which was cool. Like, stylistically, it was very impressive. Uh, but standalone, I don't know if those episodes did it. No, no. It was definitely more about that walk down memory lane. And I, I, you're right. Like, definitely brings back the nostalgia of it all, which is super cool. And there, there's no argument there, especially when you, you dive into how they did it that they brought in a real studio audience and then they remixed the theme songs and things like that. They really put in the work that is totally respectable and almost brings it up a few notches on those rewatches. Cause you start to think, Oh, they, they put them in the blue makeup and you see how they did like everything to, to like exactly how they did it in the fifties and the sixties, right. how they made I dream of genie with everything, you know, puppeteering, with the various plates and cans and things floating in the air and one big set that tracks left to right. Uh, that was all really cool. They brought in the audience members and the audi audience members got into it and dressed up in like 50s fashion. So like that adds a little bit to it when you when you after you kind of see the documentary because they put out that little Avenger behind the scenes right, yeah. documentary and you get all that and it makes it cool. But I, I still, like, if I'm just looking at it purely outside of the nostalgia and the fun, I, I don't think they were necessarily good episodes, like good TV show episodes. Right. Well, and they those first two in the black and white, they didn't really have a whole lot that they give you as far as the plot goes. You just know something's off, something strange is going on. And then you get into some of the later episodes, the three, four, five, where we move into color, we move into the 70s. And I, I couldn't peg what show the, the 70s era one was based on. I know in the 80s, it was kind of like that growing pains, all in the family type yeah. feel. And then the 90s, you got into, I think it was like more like Malcolm in the Middle and some of that. So like every episode after those first two black and white ones were were a little more unique but also moving more towards the modern styling but did you know what they styled the 70s one off of it was from from what i've seen it looked like a mixture of the partridge family and the brady bunch and ah, more so on the brady bunch but brady the bunch. theme song was very partridge family yeah i didn't think about the brady bunch yeah especially with the in the intro where they would do the the three 
like the bop 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 the uh, three hexes i should have got that one yeah and the large mm. panel was on the left and they kind of looked at each other yeah you know like the the square blocks at the opening of the brady bunch used to I have i totally forgot the brady bunch existed man <laughs> yeah so crazy brady but that's funny that you forgot that like brady bunch is so iconic how, how can you just forget like come on jan yeah jan or marcia 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 <laughs> well what's interesting about the brady bunch episode is that's the one where vision is practicing putting a diaper on a doll yeah and so fun little easter egg the doll that he is practicing on is the exact same doll that Cindy has, which is the young, the elder, the uh, youngest yeah. daughter in the Brady Bunch. It's it's the doll that she walks around with. Ah, uh, gotcha. Yeah, I didn't and pick up on cool. that one at all. Uh, uh, the steps, the steps is what gives away the Brady Bunch, though. The staircase. Because the seven, the seventies. Yeah, the the steps and the open back. I've watched a lot of Brady Bunch. I feel like I, I should have got that one, but that was that was the one that I kept being like, what did they use this one to? To inspire the, th- I think it was episode three was where we went into the seventies. Yeah, episode three. Yeah, it was because it was basically yeah they they jumped fifties, sixties, seventies, and like you said, they they went into the eighties with the the growing pains and family ties and full house, and then went into Malcolm in the Middle. And I, the one that I, I'm not going to say I I recognize this when I watched it. I kind of read it afterwards. Was Gilmore Girls? Gilmore Girls was that more of what the yeah, that was the the Malcolm in the Middle episode with the Halloween. Yeah, there are there are Gilmore Girl references uh, all throughout that, especially with the way it's shot and positioned. So you weren't a big Gilmore Girls fan? Oh, I was <laughs> similar to how my mom <laughs> would just have Star Trek on. She would also just have Gilmore Girls on. So I've seen a, a fair amount of Gilmore Girls in my day because that was just what my mom would watch. Gotcha. <laughs> so, gotcha. Uh, like I just. It wasn't a bad show. It was very quick, very quick pace. That Gilmore Girls, so that was kind of fun. I don't know if I've ever seen. I know I obviously am aware of the show, but I don't know if I've ever actually seen Gilmore Girls. But yeah, I thought that was one of the coolest things about this show was really the styling. And so you mentioned The Office, and then I think one of the the last ones was very Modern Family. Oh yeah, you know when yeah. she's when she's hanging out and like having a, a her day, you know, just doesn't want to deal yeah. with anything. Elizabeth Olsen nailed Claire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she nailed it. That was it was so good. And especially we just started watching a rewatch of Modern Family in my house because we got Peacock for the WWE network and things like that. So we're kind of exploring all of the different shows that ended up on Peacock. And Modern Family has been one of them, so it was perfect timing. So I thought that that was super fun because it's just not something we've seen recently and it kind of broke out of the mold that Marvel has been using for a while. I mean, they've proven that they can pretty much do anything and they're going to do it at a pretty high level of quality. Oh, yeah. And they rarely miss the mark with their styling choices, their genre choices and things like that. Um, but the the other thing I thought that was worth calling out here, kind of just looking at styling as a whole like we have been, was the the little commercials oh yeah that were tucked in like because you know the whole thing was delivered as a tv show inside of a tv show essentially yeah and it even came complete with era authentic commercials and they were full of easter eggs themselves oh yeah yeah like especially like i think the first one was a toaster and the toaster was made by stark industries Yep, there was this, and then there was followed. There was actually two, I think, early on, and then it was Strucker watches. Yeah, Strucker watches and Hydra soap. Yep, the bu- it was like the bubble bath Hydra soap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think people will be diving into that and really dissecting, you know, what things are and where they go. I thought the interesting one, the paper towel, was Lagos. I saw that, but I don't know if I was familiar with the name Lagos. I think Lagos is. The um and it being paper towels and the cleanup of a paper towel. I I'm not certain, but if I remember, Lagos is the city they were in when Scar with Scarlet Witch detonated the bomb. Oh, and it it went early and blew up part of the city and kind of kicked off the events of Civil War. Okay, I'm pretty sure they're in Lagos for that. So the whole motif of paper towels cleaning up a mess <laughs> and and that sort of thing. Like I, the callbacks and when we when we get into 
Falcon Winter Soldier, they're really strong there. But the callbacks to other events in the MCU's history were amazing uh, in WandaVision and Falcon Winter Soldier. Yeah, and lots of little details that have been hidden that I keep seeing, you know, on social media. People just keep pointing out new stuff here and there uh, about these little details that are super easy to overlook. Um, one thing I noticed, and, and I don't know if it matters, but in the commercials in WandaVision, uh, a lot of them had the same woman actress. Mm. I don't know if you noticed that. No, I didn't pick up on that. And now you've got me thinking of the voiceover. And there was a few that had a male act actor as well. Like I, I didn't notice that, but that's really interesting. I, and I wonder, what do you what do you think that means? I don't know, but I was just I noticed that there was I think you know especially through I think maybe episode two and then when the seventies and the eighties it was she's a brunette she had big hair, um, but I noticed that it was the same woman actress like taking the bubble bath cleaning up the mess with the paper towels. And things like that, and so I, 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 I couldn't put my finger on it. Um, and she didn't look familiar. She wasn't, from what I could tell, you know, like a casted character from a previous Marvel cinematic, you know, show. Yeah. But I just didn't know if there was something there that I wasn't picking up on. So maybe, or it could have just been another person Wanda had trapped in the town. Uh, that would make sense. Yeah. Since they all had kind of their roles, maybe she's like casted this one person as, as the, the commercial TV commercial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could be. I mean, I don't remember. It's not significant in it to me, like her face or the actress itself. So who knows though? I'm sure somebody out there has pieced it all together and figured it out. Uh, I think you're you're probably closer to it. It might not have been significant, and the way that they broke down the show with with Wanda controlling everybody in that town, and yeah. you know, using them in different aspects that you would see in these TV shows or in a small town. I, th- I think that would actually make more sense that she was just <laughs> the lady that was <laughs> casted for the the, the cassette. silly commercials, you know, that nobody remembers. Yeah. Or it's Mephisto. Because <laughs> everything's Mephisto, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was definitely what everybody believed, was that everything was Mephisto in, uh, on social as this show was coming out. Uh, the last one I did want to call out, though, because I feel like you and I could relate, but towards the, the later episodes when they did the commercial for Yo Magic. Oh, the, yeah, the yogurt The thing? yogurt, and it's, yeah. like, all intense. It was built like a Capri Sun commercial or, like, a Go-Gurt commercial at the time. And, I mean, that was very 90s. Like, that, to me, was, like, yeah. oh, my God, I miss these types of commercials. <laughs> like, it's what we yeah. grew up on. Oh, yeah, and it, it was, like, a little gruesome. Yeah. It, it had that Ren and Stimpy vibe where, like, yeah, it's animated and looks like it should be kid-friendly, but there's also some darkness to it. With the kid turning into a skeleton. Yeah, I was gonna say the kid dies. Like the, <laughs> yeah. it gives him the yo magic, like it's supposed to save him, and they're promoting it as like this healthy, conscious thing, and it like literally the kid dies. <laughs> yeah, just can't get it open. But every every kid our age, or every person our age knows the struggle of trying to open a, a snack pack. Yeah, and then even if you get it open, like if you don't have a spoon, yeah, like, oh no, what do you do? And don't come at me with that. You can turn the lid into a spoon. <laughs> It works, but why? We're trying to get the straw into the old school Capri Sun pouches. Like, have they fixed that yet? I haven't had a Capri Sun in like 10 years at least, probably 20 years. But I'm like, remember that? Like, how many times you would just stab it straight through the pouch and then the whole thing would just be leaking everywhere? Oh, yeah, dude. I am I am very familiar with that. Like, a, a sneak peek in, into my work life before I had my current job. I, I work in education, I think, at that point. That's established on the podcast. That I, I work in education where I used to be school-based and work in a school. And I would have to do lunch duty. And lunch duty... Is it all? It's exactly what it sounds like. You go, you stand in the cafeteria, and you watch, and you you supervise the kids eating lunch. And typically, when you get the younger grades, because I did work in an elementary school, so I was with younger kids, you spend most of your time just cutting open gogurt packets <laughs> and trying to poke holes in Capri Suns. And I cannot tell you how many times. I have just gotten a pair of scissors out and clipped off the edges and stuck the <laughs> <laughs> and stuck the straw on the side. Like I'm not. Fu- I'm not fussing with this. I, I, I'm not trying to poke the hole because either 
you can't get it, or when you finally do get it, it goes through the back. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I used to always yeah. stab it through the back like an idiot. Just stab it through the back. So, <laughs> but you're right. You're back. Back to the commercial. It was very, very '90s. The uh, the Malcolm in the Middle episode, the Halloween one, was so cool for that reason. Yeah, because you know, with Frankie Muniz and breaking the fourth wall. It was it was so good. Like it, it does bring back those memories of those sitcoms for us. Yeah. So let's also jump in because you know there was a lot to do about the styling of this show, but there was also a lot of story that happened in this show. Yeah. And and as I mentioned before, you know Kevin Feige had talked about how this was specifically going to kind of be the introduction of a lot of the magical side of things that is coming more in this next phase of the cinematic universe with Doctor Strange 2 that's coming and, you know, a few other shows and movies that are planned soon. And so what were your thoughts kind of around the story here? Because it was very personal and then and then also kind of got into some cool action. So we got a lot of different stuff that happened here. Yeah, I did enjoy it. And I think it is the natural progression of the MCU. With with diving into magic, they introduced it like low level magic with Wanda originally. Like you know, we I guess we didn't know that her powers were magic in Age of Ultron or Not things like that. Not officially with her, yeah, yeah. Well, and then comic book wise, she's like a mutant, but at the time they couldn't do that in MCU, MCU because they didn't have the rights to mutants, True. so they they took it in this other direction. And so now now she's magic, but then they they introduced. Doctor Strange's magic, so they've kept it low level. And I do like to see that natural progression where there are enemies and villains out there that are going to come from the world of magic, and we need to start working them in naturally into the MCU. And they did it wonderfully, like with Agnes or Agatha Harkness, you know, in, in her history dating back to Salem right. and progressing how Wanda, you know, was a low level witch to begin with and then obviously got manipulated. They did a lot of really nice world building yeah. that I think was necessary. Yeah. And using Agatha was a great way because it did introduce even darker concepts. I mean, when you see like the first Doctor Strange movie, you do see some weird stuff and, you know, you can tell, but they didn't go deep into, yeah. into too much. You know, we haven't really peeled that onion as far as the, the world of magic in Marvel. And so I did like to see some of that when you got down into her layer and she was talking about runes and the book of the damned. And, yeah, you know, I, everybody was talking about Mephisto. We mentioned that earlier. I mean, it, it seems like there's definitely some some ship sailing that way with some of yeah. what they brought in, but it never quite went as deep as I was kind of expecting. Um, I will say that, you know, I, I thought based on some of the comments that, Baj had made, and and maybe I just got caught up a little bit in all the speculation and the rumors, but I was expecting a little bit more to happen on that side. But I think ultimately they gave us enough to to be able to progress and move into the next show or the next movie, and you know really take it next level. I also really liked with this show though was just seeing how how much they showed about Scarlet Witch. Yeah. Taking us through that journey of how like devastated she was and she's already someone that's been through a lot of trauma, you know, and she's got this high of being with Vision and kind of finding her soulmate and then the low of him being completely taken from her by Thanos. Yeah. And then, you know, the reaction that would come from something like that for someone that that has been through so much already but also has such incredible powers like I, I thought that that was kind of one of the the things that got overlooked by a lot of folks or just wasn't talked about as much here but the journey that they take us on with wanda herself through this show was was pretty deep and i think that is where it benefits from being a television show versus a movie very true because you get that yeah they were only 30 minutes to 49 minutes a pop but when you get nine of them you get so much extra time to tell that that deep character story versus trying to fit her in because obviously Wanda and Vision never really got more than maybe five minutes of 
together screen time in the various Avengers movies. True, yeah. Yeah, we get little peaks here and there in Age of Ultron. They look at each other. In Civil War, we obviously get them interacting at the compound. And then, of course, as Infinity War and Endgame show, they they had a few weekends where they, they would break off and take little trips together and spend time alone. But you never really got to see them build their love together. And the TV show you know, format provides that it provides more time for them to do that. And I, and I think that's good because they're not trying to share it with anybody else. Right. Yeah. It's just them. It's just them. And I don't think that would have worked in a movie. I don't think this, this story would have worked as a movie. It needed to be serial. Like it needed to, it needed to be episodic. Yeah. I think I would agree there because there's just not enough time. And it's also kind of a strange thing that you're building, right? You know, you're talking about this relationship between, a human woman and a robot, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Even though vision obviously has a very advanced consciousness and, and emotions and everything like that, you know, it's still a little strange and probably even stranger for more casual fans. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit, a little bit, but I mean, overall the story is really good and they, they branched it out. They, they opened so many doors for them to go in various directions with the introduction of sword and, you know, the, the obviously the station that S.W.O.R.D. is, uh, the introduction of Jimmy Woo, the introduction or reintroduction of Monica Rambeau. Obviously, we saw her as a little kid in Captain Marvel, but now, you know, she, she's an adult. Monica, you bring up, I thought was really interesting because she was involved with the snap. Yeah. And I thought that, that was one of my favorite parts of this entire show was when they showed us the scenes of what was happening as people were returning after the Avengers were successful in Endgame, yeah, and the chaos that was going on, and thought it was so authentic. Like that is exactly how it would happen if you had half the population be gone for five years and then just immediately reanimate, not knowing what had happened to them or to the people that were still here, like Monica's mom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they all seem to come back at the exact location that they left. Right, yes. That was interesting for those non-heroes. Because obviously the heroes themselves, Doctor Strange and the other sorcerers, brought them to the battlefield. But for non-heroes, just regular everyday folk, I mean, that opens up a whole can of worms of different people that you could have come back in different locations and maybe they came back trapped somewhere True. because the building that they left is no longer there. Um, we'll see what they explore. But, yeah, the the events of the blip, both before and after and how they've been explored in this show were, were really, really cool. And I'm um, also I, I just think there's a world of of possibilities when it comes to the blip, because it was something we saw in Daredevil. And you remember, like the conversation that happened in the daredevil move or daredevil show where how he got his apartment. Oh, uh, when he mentions the events of the first Avengers and like the destruction or something like that, that happened. Yeah. And so like basically a bunch of construction companies wiggled, you know, used the system to their benefit to make more money because of the damage that was done in the battle of New York. Yeah. And I think we can get the exact same type of treatment with the blip. And, like, I literally, I think the possibilities are endless. Yeah, that could be pretty cool. We'll have to see who they bring back or, like, what they would do with that. You know, and you got my head my head going now because I'm just sitting here thinking, like, were there people from the past or, you know, even other shows like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or, or whatever it may be. Like, will we see any of those types of people come back? Or that That is really an interesting question. Well, and I think... It's it's going to have to be addressed in every single MCU piece of material and content moving forward. Like, were you blipped or were you not blipped? Ah. You know, because as we get the Moon Knight series, the She-Hawk series, the Eternals, all of these various movies and TV series. That's a good point. How are you not going to address the blip yeah. in some fashion? That's a very good point. Well, and as we've seen with... When Monica goes back and talks to, what's his name, Trevor or Tyler, that is the head of S.W.O.R.D. Yeah. You know, and he's mentioning about their concerns about people if they did come back or, 
you know, the struggles of what has been going on since that happened. I mean, there's a lot that changed that we didn't see in Endgame. I mean, they teased on certain things, but it was still more about, you know, the toll that that moment had on Tony or Thor or whoever, you know, the heroes themselves, not the everyday people yeah, um, or the folks in some of these ancillary positions of power. And so I, I definitely think that it does, to your point, kind of open them up for for a lot more that they could do or if they want to change directions on certain things. You know, they've kind of got that that reset button now. Yeah, reset button is a perfect way to say it because the, the blip has opened up everything to them. For all, they could rewrite character histories. True. They, they could do anything they want moving forward. Like, yeah, I'm going to use Moon Knight as the example because it's just, you know, I already referenced it. But obviously, Mark Spector is a mercenary. Egypt, his whole origin story. Well, you could throw that out the window uh, and start however you want because of the blip. You also have a lot of possibilities there because he clearly suffers from like mental disorders as part of his part of his comic book origins. Yeah. How does that factor in? Does he come back as Mark Spector or does he come back as one of his split personalities? Okay. Yeah. So like, as you dive in, as you look at each individual character and their background, how would the blip have affected them? You know, did they disappear? Did they not disappear? Did they come back the same? Did their loved ones like it? it, Like I said, it's going to, there's no way it doesn't impact everything. Well, even like the hero villain thing, we've seen that as a common trope throughout comics is that they'll use uh, certain events that happen to the heroes as triggers to create villains or other heroes from common people or citizens, you know, things like that. So I think that's probably the other question is, you know, is there going to be a a whole group of people out there that uh, thought Thanos was right? Yeah. You know, or and that forms a new faction of something, you know, it's it's endless. We could probably speculate here. You've got my mind just racing now. Of, yeah. Of what could be when I think we're we're going to get into that when we get to the Falcon and Winter Soldier, we're, we're going to get into that because the one of the main villain groups in that that's what they believe that things were better during the blip. That's a good point. Yeah, that is one example of that for sure. But you you talked about heroes becoming villains. Uh, I think that is a very real possibility for the end of WandaVision. As Wanda floated off and she recognized that she is now the Scarlet Witch, uh, which was a fun, you know, we don't need to tangent. But that was a that was a nice little fun way to bring in her comic book superhero name uh, into the mix. But she's now the Scarlet Witch, which prophecy says will be chaotic and evil right so are we going to see wanda go villain like how's that gonna play out that was one of my biggest questions coming out of the show was what they are gonna do with her because they were very specific to call that out about her being evil but we've seen her now operate on both sides of the coin as a person you know she was obviously uh, kind of looking to support Hydra and some of the bad things at the time. Cause she was mad about what happened to her, her parents and her homeland. And then she joined the Avengers. So, you know, is she a villain? And, and they don't even know, like you see that some in the show is that the reaction of sword and the FBI and everybody, like there are some questions about whether or not she can be trusted. And she is uh, actually a good person, you know, when they're investigating the events of Westview But I was curious just because of the fact that, you know, knowing her comic history and, of course, they've kind of blended a whole lot of the comic history for her character here. So it it might not mean anything, but with what she did to the mutants. Yeah. And and some of those really big storylines where she was very impactful. Is is that where we're going to go? Maybe five years down the line, once we actually get the X-Men established back into the MCU and and all of that like that would be epic 
That would be epic. Like if they were to somehow integrate the yeah the House of M. Yeah. And you know the No More Mutants storyline that would be really sweet. It would be very difficult. Yeah, bring them back. Just right. To That's what take like, them away. Could you imagine though? Like yeah, we finally get them all added in, and everybody's just yes, jacked, and then. Wanda's like, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, get out of here. But I don't know if that would quite line up with the story that they've built because they obviously they've got they avoided the whole she's Magneto's kid. Yeah, true. It, you know that that is not part of it. She's Sokovian, um, which I that could be where they go is because we get this and like and we're really starting to bleed into Falcon Winter Soldier a little bit with with Zemo coming back and talking about how Sokovia is gone. That right. the the countries around Sokovia took over. They they took the first chance they could to take lands and extend their borders. How is she gonna react to that now that her home country no longer exists? Yeah, I mean, it definitely will keep her potentially volatile for the near future. Yeah, and you know, the stronger she gets, the more she learns. You know, it'll be interesting to see. I, I have a feeling, though, that she's going to get really closely tied in some ways to Doctor Strange. Yeah. And we saw that with, you know, the end of the show and, and the final credit scene where she was studying and she was there was no insinuation of Doctor Strange. But to me, just the way she was like sitting there reading the book and meditating. I mean, that looked exactly like how Doctor Strange oh, yeah. does it. So it just kind of assumes like. Did she go find Strange before this cabin? You know, things like that. But, I mean, it just left so many questions at the end of this show that we we just got to wait for answers on now. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. I, I, I with you, it was very Doctor Strange-like. Very Doctor Strange. And I think they name-dropped the Sorcerer Supreme. Yeah. Like, Harkness said that, you know, the in theory or in... In lore... In lore, thank you. Yeah, in lore that the Scarlet Witch is superior than the Sorcerer Supreme right. in regards to just raw power. Right. So, I mean, who knows? Yeah, the, the magic world is just so deep. There, there's so many different directions and things you can do when, when you introduce magic yeah. in, into, into the world. Well, and they're bringing in the Multiverse of Madness. Like, that's something that we know is, it's literally the title of the next Doctor Strange film, is the Multiverse yeah. of Madness. So, I mean, like, that should be insane. Oh, yeah. I mean, the amount of stuff and just oddities and horrors and insanity that comes with the Multiverse of Madness, if you've ever read a single Doctor Strange book, could really get wild. Well, and I, that's how I hope they bring in the X-Men. That's how I hope they bring in the mutants, because we already saw it with the Evan Peters guest spot, you know, blending that 20th century Fox version of Quicksilver. (laughs) And now they brought him in over. Well, that was like the whole thing. That's why everybody popped. Yeah. Like when Evan Peters showed up and they're like, oh, they recast Pietro. It was like, well, he was kind of the original Pietro. That's true. Like this and that. So and obviously that ended with him not being. Like he he was just a placeholder and and faking it. He wasn't the real Quicksilver. But hey, they did it. They opened that door to show that you can take existing MCU characters, put a new face on them, and and say, hey, they're just from a different universe. Well, one of the few things I wanted to make sure we talked about here before we wrap up on this, uh, and you you kind of hit it on the head there when you said putting a new face on somebody that we were familiar with from before. There was a lot of swirl on social media while WandaVision was releasing, or a lot of fan theories, that the head of S.W.O.R.D. was actually Ultron. Oh. And I don't know if you caught any of that, but there was some folks that I think there was some storylines in the comics that, you know, Ultron had assumed essentially like a human form. Yeah. And, and it wasn't, I think, perfectly tied to this character that we see in the show. But I thought that there was some interesting stuff there that could support that, even though we never got a reveal. Yeah. But I was looking at it from the standpoint of, like, he was good friends with Monica. Yeah. He was clearly close with Monica's mother, who ran S.W.O.R.D. before, I guess, she had died with cancer and the blip and everything like that. But then all of a sudden, he just turns on her. And, and you know, if you watch the way the show progresses, he goes from, like, nice and helpful at the beginning to just, like, I don't trust you, Monica. 
I don't like powered people. I don't like Wanda, you know, and it was kind of this like hell bent Moby Dick situation where he was just like, I have to get the, the vision. I have to be done with Wanda. And, and they never truly gave us a reason why hmm. he went from like, almost like he would trust anything Monica says to, I want nothing to do with you. And that was something I was kind of watching closely in my rewatch because I was I was kind of confused about that in the first time I watched through it. And and then I noticed like they really never gave you any true moment. Like, yeah, she defies his orders and stuff like that, but that's like really basic ass, like pumpkin spice latte plot. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, oh the the subordinate, you know, doesn't follow the orders of their hard ass, you know, military leader. <laughs> yeah. Says every other movie in history. <laughs> You know right. what I mean? <laughs> but like that that was kind of the only thing that I saw. And so even though we never got a true confirmation that this guy could be Ultron, I was thinking, well, maybe he could be. Like maybe there is something there as to why he seemed to have his own agenda. Could be. I don't know if I would necessarily take that in the Ultron way and almost think of it in he could be a Cree. He could be Cree kind of sent to Earth. Because there's one little line in it where they talk about what S.W.O.R.D. stands for in the Sentient Weapon Observation Response Division. Right. And Mo- Monica says, observation. When did that turn into creation? Ah, uh, yeah. And he's like, oh, well, think times have changed since the blip. And, you know, we, we had to modernize. We had to move with the times. So that turned into creation. So I guess... In my head, I'm thinking oh, I could take this in a few different directions. Either he's just another power hungry government official that wants to create an ultimate weapon, or is he a Cree that is basically trying to make the equivalent of a Cree Sentinel? Ah, uh, okay. In the preparing for the Scrawl War, which was also half hinted at in Monica's post credit scene. Yeah, that's possible. That's possible. I, I guess I was just thinking more Ultron and kind of buying into some of that just because of, you know, how tied to Vision Ultron is or like how intertwined their histories are. Yeah. So uh, I was kind of thinking like, yeah, maybe this will be true because it's not like he died. You know, they arrested him, but he is still very much out there in the universe here. And so it made me wonder if it was like he's going to come back at some point in a future show or movie. I'm sure they could find a way to bring him back. I'm trying to think at the end of Age of Ultron, Vision does, like, they kind of make that point where if any of the Iron Robots get away, then Ultron is going to survive, so they have to kill all of them. And there is that scene at the end of that movie where Vision chases down the very last one. They have a little monologue, and then he ultimately destroys it. But was he the last one? But was he the last (laughs) one? Yeah, you never know. Ultron's a tough one because he's he's so oriented on dest- in destruction in most cases that is he really going to play the long game? That's fair. Or like he I he takes me as a character that isn't going to be patient. He's going to want to destroy everything the second he gets an opportunity. So why would he pretend to be a human for so long? That's fair. Yeah. I don't know. I don't mean to like totally debunk your your theory or anything, but that that's oh, not my, my take on Ultron. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't my theory. That was the internet's theory. I was just kind of buying into it, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd I'd like it either way. I mean, although uh, I shouldn't say I'd like it either way, because I'd preferably I'd like them to see move forward. There's there's only a handful of villains I'd like to see come back, and unfortunately, Ultron's not really one of them, uh, unless it's like an alternate universe, and you're going to give me a legitimate. Age of Ultron. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, it was <laughs> not with them already have burning the Age of Ultron story when it wasn't even really yeah. half as good, truly, as what the comic version was. Yeah, that Bendis, that Bendis story from in the past 10 years is just something else. Yeah. So maybe one of the last things here on WandaVision, um, what do you think is going to happen with White Vision? Because that was another big reveal we got towards the end of the show was was they rebuilt this new version of of Vision who is all white. He doesn't have the Mind Stone, of course, but he's you know got definitely a, a powerful blue 
laser beam thing in his head. Yeah. Um, had a really cool look with the crystal blue. He was almost like a white walker. Yeah. You know, he had like yeah. the crystal blue eyes and the all white body, but he's a emotionless version of vision, kind of more of a perfect sentient that they want out of a robot. Um, and we see him come and obviously he's fighting. There was some cool fight scenes that we got towards the end of the series with him and vision. Uh, and then ultimately, Vision kind of downloads or or unlocks the memories of the real Vision for White Vision before he just kind of disappears. So I was curious what your thoughts or um, predictions are as far as what's going to happen with White Vision. Yeah, shout out to the Ship of Theseus battle. That was sweet. <laughs> yeah, that was a yeah. really cool moment. That, that was really cool, but... Uh, yeah, I, I'm not totally sure what they're going to do with White Vision. It would, it would be interesting to kind of see him go away for a bit and maybe disappear for a couple series or movies and then make an epic comeback because he does. He has all the memories now. He he has all of the data, all the memories, what would seem everything but the Mind Stone in regards to his powers. Right. So it would be cool to see him kind of disappear for a bit and maybe do like a Dr. Manhattan type deal where he goes and just sits on the moon for a while and <laughs> and contemplates life and in his place in the universe and then make some sort of epic comeback and maybe play that. I love characters of Grey, and I, I think you're kind of with me on that, where characters that are really ambivalent, whether they're good or bad, and I and I think they have a great opportunity in White Vision to play that that neutral role, like he he's going to... Sometimes attack the Avengers. Sometimes he's going to help the Avengers. And we really don't know. So I can't say what I, exactly what I think is going to happen. Um, I guess if, if I was cornered into it, he's going to go to the moon and think for a bit and then make an <laughs> epic comeback one day. Did you did you think they were going to take him in a specific direction? Nah, nothing that specifically stands out. I mean, I was happy to see that, you know, he seems to be part of the universe moving forward because I really always have liked the Vision character. And Paul Bettany has been great for that character. So I think that it's good to see that in some way, shape, or form, he's still here. Because originally I had this thought that, okay, well, maybe this WandaVision was going to be the last that we would truly see of Vision in the MCU. But he's such a long-term, long-standing Avenger character and such a powerful being in the MCU that I didn't know if it was like, okay, is he really going to be gone forever? Yeah. But I think that you probably make some sense. Let him go and maybe be away for a while and then come back in like an epic return Mm -hmm. or something like that. Like when the, the Avengers really need him or Wanda really needs him at a future moment um, because they can't just put him right back in. Yeah. You know, he's not the original vision. There's not going to be a trust level yet. Like he can't just go back to dating Wanda. Yeah. And, and all of that. So time away would probably make sense and then find some way to, to work him back in either as maybe a threat that they have to quell. Like he could be a bad, a big bad in a movie, maybe not a trilogy, but like a, a single shot movie. Yeah. And then get him back on the good side. I don't know. Try to work him in. Yeah. I don't foresee him just showing up, picking up Mjolnir and then being like, oh, cool. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like like nobody's going to be cool with that right away. Especially if people start talking about white vision and what happened there at Westview in the WandaVision series. Like there's a lot of people that look at him like he's a bad creature. He was attacking them. He was part of this guy from Sword's evil plan. So. And it was cool to see him just as soon as he came to the realization that his creators have been lying to him to some extent in sword. He just bolted. Yeah. Like no, no sitting there talking it out with Wanda's vision. Like just I'm out like good. Like, thank you for the information. And then he took off through the roof of the library and no, nobody brought him up again. So yeah, he's on the moon. He's just chilling. He's kicking it on the moon. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot, you know, we could have covered probably even more here, but there's there's a lot that they did in this little mini series, and and I cannot wait really to see see where we go from here. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, Wandavision was certainly unique in its stylization as well as the story itself. 
We'll see where the folks at Disney and Marvel Studios take the fans next as more series and movies will continue to branch out. Kyle's Top 5 Captain Americas Number 5 Bucky Barnes While I much prefer my former sidekicks to stand on their own as heroes, Bucky makes the list just because how much I like him as a character, using his dicey past as a backdrop for the redemption-style story as he navigates what it means to be the symbol of Cap. Number 4 Frank Castle Speaking of what it means to be Cap, Over the years, there have been a few what-if scenarios where Frank finds himself as Captain America versus the Punisher. Steve was, of course, a childhood hero of Frank's, and it's always fun to see him take that different path. Number three. Peggy Carter. Continuing the what-if trend, even if someone's only knowledge of Peggy comes from the MCU version, it's still a great representation of how badass, smart, and fully capable she is. So anytime the past has altered to have Peggy Carter step in as the role of captain, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Number two. Sam Wilson. Stepping into the role is what it's all about here. When Steve gets aged at the hands of the Iron Nail, the world needs a new captain. And Sam is the right person to step up. Lifelong friend and ally of Steve, it just made sense. It did take him a while to find himself, especially with so many both in comic and real life against him being Captain America, but he certainly stepped up to the task. And number one. Steve Rogers. Of course it had to be Steve. He is Captain America, embodying more than just the name. He is what the mantle and figure stands for. Well, since we were talking Marvel television today and both of us were highly anticipating the Falcon and Winter Soldier, we wanted to take a few minutes and share our initial impressions of the show since the first three episodes have been released. In fact, it's kind of a great time to be Kyle right now because Bucky Barnes, a.k.a. the Winter Soldier, is one of his favorite comic characters out there. And so naturally, I think I'm going to pass it over to you to get us started here as I'm really interested to hear your thoughts since we have actually not talked about this show at all. Yeah, we we really haven't. Uh, I waited until the first two episodes came out before I dove in, and then once I did, I I realized that I wasn't going to be able to wait like I did with WandaVision until a few come out and then binge them all. Like I needed the the weekly release. I am in love with the the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. This, This series has been so good, and... We, we talked about it maybe a little bit before where I see this series as a continuation of Captain's movies. So you got Captain America, the first Avenger, then you got Winter Soldier and then Civil War. And a lot of what happened in those movies is carrying over into this series. And so that trilogy was already my favorite in the MCU. And so I'm really just getting more of those stories, a deeper dive into the psyche of Bucky and a deeper dive into life after the the battling stops. Yeah. Like what what happens to these characters in their everyday lives which is really cool to see that from Sam's perspective as he goes back home and he sees yeah, he's been living life as an avenger, traveling the world, fighting monsters and aliens or one of the big 3, you know, androids, aliens or wizards. Right, yeah. Uh and now what his family is struggling. Like it's crazy and it's a really interesting story to tell that what what do these heroes and these people do when they take the masks off and they have to just go be everyday citizens i like that i thought that his parts of the story were very down to earth yeah and and so my notes here were that it did add some additional depth to the character one because up until this point he has been a little bit more of a side character so we haven't gotten that deep look into him in the mcu yeah he's also not a character for me that i've followed in the comics per se you know he shows up here or there but i'm not grabbing you know falcon trades or anything like that yeah so i am not as familiar with all of the backstory and the side story and all of that that comes with sam wilson even though you know i think what they've done with anthony mackie and everything in the mcu has been 
awesome. You know, he's a great character, great action. Oh, yeah. When he gets going with the wings and everything like that. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you really, really like it. Like, I was really hoping that it was going to hit all the the check boxes for you just because it is in your wheelhouse. And I like that you said continuation of Captain. I, I don't know if I thought about it from that standpoint, mm-hmm. even though it is definitely obviously that. But once you said that, it made me click that the styling of the show is definitely very much like the Captain America movies, and those were great. So it is kind of cool to to kind of come back to more of that modern action type styling, and almost a spy thriller. Like yeah, that was one of, of my favorite things. Yeah, a little bit spy. Like Winter Soldier was very much like a political spy drama. Right. Not quite Manchurian Candidate, but approaching Manchurian Candidate. I think actually Tony makes that joke <laughs> at some point in Civil War, but. They continue that, and it's really cool. The dynamic between Bucky and Sam is really cool, too, as, like, they're not friends, and they were they were never friends. They just had a mutual friend in, in Steve, and now they're trying to navigate their friendship, which historically has been rocky. Right. And, and seeing them come together, and we'll see as the series progress. There's only three episodes out right now, and so they're still not quite clicking both as friends and as a team when in battle, because that, that was something I picked up on in the second episode where Sam actually goes to take a swipe at somebody and he's got his wings extended and his wings almost clip Bucky to the point where it knocks Uh, Bucky off the truck. Yeah. And I was like, Ooh, well done Marvel for like sneaking that in kind of showing they're not on the same page, you know? And we saw that in the third episode as well, where, Hey, I went right. You went left. Right. (laughs) You're supposed to follow me. Yeah, you're supposed to follow me. Every action movie ever. Yeah, he did say that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I think, I really think that it's going to be cool seeing the development of their relationship moving forward and how they work as a team and how they, they battle up against folks like Flag Smashers and the Power Brokers as, as more villains get revealed. Yeah, I one thing I have to say to differ a little bit or contrast was the first two episodes were kind of meh to me. Oh. If I can say that. Like the action was really good. I was happy that I was watching what I was watching. Yeah. But just they were a little bit slower. It just felt a little vanilla in some ways. Like the Flag Smashers, the idea of them and them being tied into the snap and what was going on and how the world was in the previous five years before everybody came back. That aspect was interesting to me, but the the bits and pieces of the group that made them up, you know, the villains or the enemies seemed very basic. Like, they were just another group of super soldiers. Yeah. And so, like, there was just some aspects that I just wasn't getting sucked in the way I was, like, expecting and hoping for. Yeah. So it wasn't that I didn't like it. I definitely was still excited to see it. But there was only a few parts of those first two episodes that I really found myself gravitating towards. And, And a big part of it was actually what you mentioned was the background on Bucky. Yeah. And seeing what he was going through and the therapy and the struggles mentally and trying to atone for things. You know, I thought that 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 was probably the most interesting aspect of the first two episodes, even to the point where it actually had me kind of not getting emotional, but like thinking. And I try not to do this very often, but like thinking, like, what would it be like? You know, because you see Bucky struggling, and even Sam, but you see them both struggling so hard with the fact that they suddenly lost their friend. Yeah. Steve, who, for Bucky, he had been with for over 100 years, you know? And and so I looked, it just had me thinking about our group of friends. We've all known each other pretty much our whole lives. And I was like, yeah, man. I was like, if if something happened to Kyle or Alex or Barry or whoever, you know, if one of us was just suddenly gone. Yeah. I was like, I would probably feel just like they do right now. And I thought that they did a good job showing that and genuinely portraying that type of emotional distress, I guess, or yeah, sadness, whatever you want to call it. No, I, and I, I 
to kind of build upon that, one thing I, I think they did well, and it's very subtle, and I might be the only person thinking of that, is like Bucky has no friends, and he's clearly secluding himself on purpose, except for the one person he's allowing himself to get semi close to, and it's that old man. Right. And I was like, it's very interesting that they're portraying that the only person Bucky seems to be allowing to be considered a friend is someone who is also extremely old. Yeah. Because while Bucky is young, visibly, he he's he has an old soul. Right. Yeah. So it would make sense for him to surround himself with elderly people because that's how he feels inside. Uh, and, and it's all building that psyche on, on him. I think that's. It'd be very cool, you know, dealing with the fallout of PTSD and a lifetime of killing and trying to find yourself as a new person. Uh, We'll see where it goes. We'll see where it goes. I I think each episode has built upon itself to get better and better. Yes. And I'm glad you say that because that was going to be kind of the final thing I was going to swing back to is, is, you know, because I pretty much was just saying, eh, meh on the first two. But episode three. That came out yesterday, and I don't want to go too crazy on spoilers here because I know that you know it is fresh off the gate yeah. at a time of recording this, and so some people may not have seen it. But I thought that episode three kind of changed the whole game for me here, and I was sucked in to what was going on there. Like it just had darker tones, seedier tones. Well, Matapor visually looked. Yes, that's exactly ridiculous. what I was about to say. Was Madripoor yeah. oh, looked sorry. Ama- No, it's fine. You. <laughs> <laughs> We're right on the same page because Madripoor was cool. It kind of looked like um, Cyberpunk's Night City, like kind of techno, kind of modern, but also had a lot of seediness going on. And and just kind of the whole vibe of episode three kind of took me more to where I was expecting or envisioning going into episode one. I was like, okay, this is what I wanted out of this show. And, and even though it might have had a little less action, well, that's not even hard to say. We had a little bit different action Di- yeah. with them. Yeah, I I still just found it to be my favorite so far. And that's that's fair. I think the first one and it's very similar to Wandavision. Maybe the first one they didn't want to give it all away out the gate, and they wanted to build upon it. But you're right. By episode three, they've built in, they've introduced so many characters, and everybody is who's good, who's bad. Because cause by episode three, you've got, obviously, Sam and Bucky, and we're with them. There are heroes in this case. But then you've introduced Sharon, who historically, yeah, is a hero, but she's been forced to live through some tough times. Right. So now she's dicey, and who did she get in a car with there at the end of that episode? Like, True. Who are, who are her connections? Clearly, she had to go on the, on the, you know, the deep ground. Nemo. We brought Nemo back in. I love a good good guy forcing to team up with a bad guy for a mutual enemy. That's going to be super cool. He also had a pretty couple badass moments where... Well, and the actor's playing him well, too. Yeah, yeah. The whole thing with Nemo is... or Yeah, is it Baron Nemo or Baron Zemo? Baron, Baron Zemo, Zemo, sorry. okay. We were over here. Yeah, Baron... You, I started... Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. Just started going through yeah. my head, thinking. Nemo. Yeah, my fault. <laughs> Disney verse. Ah. Disney verse. Uh, yeah, Baron yeah. Nemo over here. That would Ellen's be- going to come in and <laughs> debut. Anyways, no, don't go down this path. But it, it could be good. But then they introduced. Okay, so the Flag Smashers, uh, obviously bad guys, but they betrayed another set of bad people in the power broker. So who's the power broker? Who are the Flag Smashers? What are we fighting for? Like even Sam said at one point. You can't blame the Flag Smashers for what they're trying to do. Right. And then you 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 throw in the big question mark, and that's John Walker. Yeah, yeah. And what is going to happen with this new Captain America? Well, and that's another place I was really curious to see, because you are a resident Captain America expert. And so what were your thoughts when you first saw him introduced? I, uh... He's certainly different. We'll get the obvious out of the way. John Walker is not Steve Rogers. What I like about him is he, on multiple occasions now, has said, I'm not trying to be Steve Rogers. Like, I can't, obviously, I'm never going to be Steve or what he was to so many people. I'm just trying to be me and and be the best Captain America I can. And while he's certainly more aggressive, and I, I kind of like that take, 
It, and I think I'm in the minority here where I like John Walker. Now, I'm not going to say that I like him as Captain America, but I'm also not going to go down the whole hashtag not my Captain America thing <laughs> because I, I like him. He brings something new and different to the character. And I honestly, moving forward, I wouldn't mind if they stayed true to some of the source material on John Walker, where like he is more aggressive than Steve ever was. And that creates conflict both for the heroes around him and like the government potentially, yeah. because he's going to put himself in dicey situations. Now, how's it all going to play out? Are they going to keep him as Captain America? I don't want to see them turn him into a legitimate villain. I don't think that's good. I, I like the areas of gray more than I like making him a clear cut villain. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of the theme that we are seeing really grow here with these shows. I mean, somewhat even in WandaVision and the later half of that season and some of the things they showed us, some of the things we just talked about with sword and everything, but getting into this show, like it is very apparent that there is a lot of confusion mm -hmm. in the world after everything that happened in Endgame that there is very little black and white. You know, the whole world right now is gray, trying to get sorted out and figure out where people are going to land. And and most of what people were used to pre-Endgame events is not what they're going to get moving forward, whether it's even something as, oh, yeah. as comforting or as familiar as Captain America. And I thought it was interesting you said, like, he's definitely not Steve. But one of the notes I had here that I, I found intriguing with the character, and, and it's somebody that I'm not super familiar with either from the comics, um, so I don't have a whole lot of the backstory on him. But he definitely acts different in a lot of ways than Steve. He's more violent. You can tell that. Yeah. But I thought it was interesting, and especially I think at the beginning of episode three, he's also, though, trying to use like kind of like a privilege of captain america like you see him like yeah he's like trying to demand all the same respect that steve earned for the mantle and steve earned for himself as a human yeah but then take it in these different ways and, and i'm my own man kind of deal so i thought that was kind of an interesting dynamic in some cases like when he's like do you know who i am yeah. To the guy at the beginning of episode three, like, you know, I'm Captain America. Like, I've been doing all the, the Captain America doing all these things for the last 20 years saving the world. But really, you're not. Yeah. You know, like, and it doesn't quite work that way. So I there's it could make for some really good depth. Oh, yeah. To what happens with him and the character as we move forward. Well, to hammer that home in the second episode, when they get Bucky out of jail and he kind of gets him out of doing his court ordered therapy. They say like on whose authority. And he kind of just looks and, and he looks and points to himself like, Oh yeah. You know me, I'm, I'm captain America on my authority. Right. And it's, yeah, it, it would be very interesting to see kind of, I, I think you're right. Privilege is the, is the right word there where he is saying like, I'm captain America now. And so you have to, all the respect you gave Steve, you now have to give me now in his defense, he did put in the work. They've 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 definitely shown that that he is a veteran. Right. And, you know, three time Medal of Honor winner, I believe. Is very the, military. Very military. Yeah. Like established career. His his resume is spot on. And they showed him in the training sessions throwing the sword or throwing the, sh the sword, throwing the shield around. And kind of showing like, man, he's got the pedigree. Right. But the problem is he hasn't done enough as captain america to to be able to play that card just yet yeah he he's a hero in the traditional sense of like what we have in real life you know i mean yeah somebody that decorated out of a military career would absolutely be a superhero in real life you know on on our planet oh yeah uh, in this country but yeah it's totally different picking up the mantle of captain america and it's almost like he was treating it like like the mantle of president. Yeah. Like, you know, no matter who's president, you just automatically are in charge. You have the authority. You're respected in most cases. Um, but you know what I mean? And and so it's almost like he was just like, whoever's going to wear this helmet and carry this shield is just gets all of that. Yeah. And, and that's not really the case because, you know, 
Steve Rogers wasn't technically a military man. Right. You know, and, and there was just so much different that he had to, to go through. Just seeing the differences and being that this is our first introduction to a non Chris Evans, Steve Rogers, Captain America, it's like hard not to directly compare them to. Oh, yeah. And you never know. One, one thing I thought of is Steve's, you know, journey into being Captain America wasn't exactly easy. No. I know when, when he first became Captain America, as they showed, he wasn't immediately put into action. They thought he was a wasted science experiment. So they used him for boosters and, and things like that. And selling it, bonds. Selling bonds. Yeah, he was selling bonds for a long time, singing and dancing and doing the fake punch. And he didn't earn the respect. He had that moment in Captain America, the first Avengers, where he went overseas and did the whole selling the bonds bit to the guys in the military. And they just sat there stone faced and and didn't respect him. And I was like, man, they could kind of take John Walker through a very similar path where, yeah, you're Captain America and the government says this and that, but you need to earn my respect. Right. And and that's something we're definitely seeing right now with Sam and Bucky. And then unlike his, his sidekick who I don't really want to call sidekick. He called himself a partner, but Battlestar (laughs) and Lamar Hoskins. Yeah. Like, you know, he's got the, he Lamar's been next to him the whole time. So he's got his respect and they work together. Right. But it's the, the bigger universe that you need to, you need to prove it to. I mean, there's definitely still a lot to come here, and it is early on, so it's hard to to truly say exactly what's going to happen, but those are really kind of my core first impressions of these first couple of episodes, and, and I, I, it seems like it's on an upward trajectory. Oh, yeah, and, and I'm there's so many little threads that they've introduced in the first three episodes that I, I'm so interested to see where they take it. One of the biggest ones that we haven't quite touched on yet is isaiah bradley in episode two where they really introduce the fact that there were super soldiers that the u.s government created after steve went into ice and that was a deep cut a sweet sweet deep cut into marvel's history yeah and then there was also a subtle introduction to a character i many people probably aren't familiar with in elijah bradley who's the grandson that opened the door. Okay. He goes on to be one of the founding members or original members of the Young Avengers. Oh, I don't think I picked up on him. Yeah, he takes the code name Patriot oh. and is a Young Avenger. And there's a lot of really cool dynamics for how his comic book origins come about because he, I don't want to spoil it, but... Uh, he essentially gets a blood transfusion with his grandfather, which then gives him super soldier serum in his body. Now, there's a little more to that in, in anyone that's read Young Avengers could probably call me out and be like, that's <laughs> not accurate. But in, in the nutshell. beginning, in a nutshell, in the beginning, that that is how his powers are perceived. You know, after after a couple story arcs, they kind of change that a little bit. And they do something different with him. But in that very first Young Avengers arc, that's how he came about his powers. And so introducing Isaiah, not only to fill a couple of the gaps and to progress the story of what's happening with the super soldier serum. Right. But to also introduce, a, a, you know, Elijah or, yeah, introduce Eli, which eventually becomes Patriot. And on the flip side, having already introduced Billy and Tommy. We are very slowly putting together the Young Avengers. That's a good point, yeah, because Billy and Tommy, we didn't even touch on that in our WandaVision discussion, but they were definitely a big part of that show. And I know a lot of people were like, oh, Wicked and Speed. Yeah. And the questions there. So you really now have opened up a whole nother can of worms because I did not pick up on the grandson. You know, I was familiar with some of the other super soldiers you know outside of cap and so i thought that that was kind of cool and there's a little bit of social commentary there yeah you know i thought that was made in that scene but i didn't i didn't realize that the grandson had a tie to young avengers so look at marvel over here setting up like the 2030 2040 phases of the mcu (laughs) yeah man like dude mixing in and mixing in hawkeye and they're bringing in kate bishop 
So I'm like, I'm just sitting here seeing, and there's rumors of Kang the Conqueror Ooh, showing up yeah. in one of these, and Iron Lad, if anybody's read Young Avengers, Iron Lad is actually just a young version of Kang. So my, my brain is just like, oh my God, it's going to be the Young Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, that would be cool. And I mean, and that's something we haven't seen too much on the on the big screen in the live action side of things is you know some of those characters some that you know appeal a little bit i mean they all appeal to to young people and kids yeah but actually putting in more of those characters that are actually young people and kids but still doing those things could really be another pop-off for the marvel universe and the whole brand as far as the television and movies go Oh, yeah. And it's something neither Marvel nor DC has attempted. Like, obviously, DC has Titans, the show, but live action wise, nobody's quite totally experimented with with younger heroes. New The New Mutants movie just never released. So we haven't fully taken a a, a dive into teenage heroes just yet. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, keeping with our Marvel theme here, I'll say that the Falcon and the Winter Soldier will return. Once the season wraps up, Chris and I will do a more in-depth discussion. So hit us up on social media to let us know your thoughts on the series, John Walker, and all things MCU. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, be sure to hit the subscribe button to get new chapters of Geek Catch Up every two weeks on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, CastBox, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Be sure to follow the show on social media. You can find us on Facebook and YouTube at Geek Catch Up Podcast or on Twitter and Instagram at Geek Catch Up Pod. Links to all these accounts are in the show notes below and on our website, geekcatchuppodcast.com. Stay saucy, you nerds. <laughs>